Okay, so we just hung up and we realized, Tyrell and I did, that um, we didn't talk about a whole collection of work that we were both actually really excited about. So welcome to this bonus feature of Seamside Ooh. with Tyrell. Tyrell, the, the collection we didn't talk about was Better Don't. And what can you tell us about Better Don't? Oh, Better Don't. That's probably one of my personal favorites, given that they're cute and short works that make quite the landing on a lot of different fronts. Um, and so Better Don't is a series that I've been doing. Um, I'm on number eight right now. I'm trying to get to 10, and then I might rethink about where the direction of it goes. But it's kind of like an ongoing uh, study I've been doing of incorporating text into my work. Um, not only, again, from like a historical context, because that's where a lot of this idea stemmed from, of um, kind of in the heyday of the trading posts, marketing and economy that Navajo weaving had been so heavily grounded in for, you know, a few, like a hundred years or so. Um, as part of that, when text first made its assurgence into weaving, um, it was pretty much like commissioned pieces. More often than not, traders would like write on a piece of paper, like trading post names, um, commissioned last names of buyers, dates, place names. Um, but pretty much nothing that ever really spoke to the weaver themselves. And it kind of, uh, as I was thinking about this, it really played into the overall theme that I had been seeing in a lot of works and is really seen just for most of the, the commercialization of Navajo weaving, which is um, lack of creative agency. And so I just thought it was funny that it was, you see all of these text pieces and more often than not, like for a long time, a lot of these weavers didn't even speak like a lick of English, let alone know how to write. So I just thought it was really amazing that they were weaving words. And from a technical perspective, it's kind of hard to weave letters, um, like just to get the proportions right and everything. Um, so in terms of like personal study, I wanted just to use letters a little more. Um, but outside of that historical kind of um, lens, I also wanted to touch base on, again, that idea of like creative agency, like given that we haven't ever been able to weave with our own motifs at our own right, um, it also just feels very scripted in, in some regard, like during this, the trading post um, economy really influenced weaving to a degree that like, we are getting a lot of these regional styles that families really hold to and kind of claim as their identity. But also you kind of get lost in like, where's our humanity in that? We became more like machines and manufacturers than actual artists for a considerable amount of time. I, I, I don't think that com those identities can be fully separated, but in terms of, again, like why people were weaving, that's kind of where a lot of the output had been, the direction of the output had been. Um, so the Better Don't series is pretty much an idea of like, um, what is a way of documenting how I, as a contemporary Navajo weaver, view and look at the world um, and using text to accomplish that? Because... You know, you may not understand anything about Navajo weaving. You may not even know about the Navajo culture or people in general. But if you're an English speaking person and know how to read, like you can have these ideas spoon fed to you. And their very honest transparency kind of brings a lot of people to that conversation. So the three heavy hitters of this series started out with um, fuck, slut, and then butt stuff, question mark. Um, and... They were really funny se a series just uh, just to play out. Um, and I had incorporated them for a group show over in um, the Bowery with James Fuentes. So it seemed like a really inappropriate space for that. Um, but also in terms of like community turmoil, this is the first series I've had of not having my work well received within my community. Um, honestly, like my biggest like uh, critics of my work are my own like demographic, which I think makes sense for the sake of like, there's a lot of layers of context that my own demographic can understand and see and have pre-existing really personal relationships with the work that a lot of my work doesn't really fit or correlate well with, which is fine and fine and dandy. But in terms of like really stirring the pot, these pieces had really a, 
had done a great job of accomplishing that. Um, but uh, as part of an ongoing series, it is kind of, in essence, really just a fun institutional critique of what do we see Navajo weaving as and what are we choosing to uphold as part of that conversation? Um, and to cap that idea is like, when I think about weavers, I think that a lot of queer and gay weavers are pretty much like the kind of main contributors to a lot of the this new shift in direction of aesthetics that we're experiencing and seeing right now. And when I think about that community and a lot of these master weavers, I think of them using fuck. I think of them as sluts. Uh, and a lot of them, and most people, enjoy butt stuff. So again, talking about this humanity and relationship and honesty that we have with our practice and culture, I think that these are important things that should be documented, should be talked about. Because I personally have never seen any words like these put in and documented within the medium itself. So at least adding to that conversation and expanding on that idea of what weaving can and could look like, I think that this was a step that I felt was important to take. Yeah, and on, on multiple levels too, right? So, I mean, you mentioned that it's important to document your practice and your culture in this, but it's also documenting our, our human bodies and the things that are pleasurable to almost all of us. And um, it also makes me think too that the idea of aesthetic and like you mentioned the trading post economy, that that's something that you hear from the G's Bend folks as well, which is like, there's this improv style of quilting that G's Bend is really well known for. And at some point in time, an aesthetic just got frozen. And yeah the market demanded a certain aesthetic come out of this particular place in Alabama. And what agency does that leave the quilters with, right? Do they continue making the stuff they know will sell that the market demands or can they put their own voice and their own spin and how will that be received by the large market? 110%. And I'm still experiencing this right now. Like I had alluded to this native pop cultural movement that we're experiencing within the generalized pop culture and art sphere um, that kind of validates and um, kind of makes room for a lot of these improv weavings, but also from that's kind of like West coast and like East coast kind of marketing art spheres. But with here in the Southwest, it's really, really difficult to push past a lot of those um like dated aesthetics. Um, and when a lot of people who, who are weaving or who contribute to th this weaver pool and lineup and roster, um, they tend to look at that as the default and kind of like um, epitome and standard for what weaving is. And so that's fine and dandy in terms of like preservation and again, like family ties because there's been such a like, a do well documented and established history for that type of aesthetic but also in terms of the medium still being art it's still being uh, expressionistic of the individuals who are making them it is very limiting and in, in some sense like harmful for like the direction and continuous continuation of the medium so i i have been like like i said i don't really see myself as a classically trained navajo weaver but I have spent my time studying and weaving a lot of these trading post designs from all over the Navajo Nation, just so I can understand from a technical perspective, as well as, you know, peel back layers of like um, incorporation of these pop designs, like Navajo weaving from the get go, even pre-contact, like they've, it's always gone hand in hand with pop culture, these new designs, these new situations, and a lot of these um, motifs that we see pretty much are not like traditional in essence, like true traditional Navajo weaving is plain stripes, big, bold stripes, small stripes, or natural colors, or even down into twill weaving, like re, re consistent, um, systematic design patterns. Um, and everything outside of that had been introduced at some point in time and came from somewhere else that wasn't like of our own, um, our own knowledge or kind of creation. But uh, yeah, and like I said, I think that works like better don't. And a lot of the pieces that I've been putting out recently really challenge a, 
and place our community into a space of like, what is possible to contribute to this pool? Um, is it something we should contribute to? Is that a decision for the community to make? Or does this happen on an individual level? Um, it's kind of this can of worms that, depending on who you ask, is a stagnant or fluid conversation. Um, and I just think that it's important to get as much um, get as much voices at the table as possible. Okay, so Tyrell, now I have a question for you that in our main conversation, you mentioned that your family for a long time has used a pattern called bird spill that you've also incorporated in some of your work. And you mentioned that as far as you know, only two people know how to weave this particular pattern, you and your great uncle. How important is it? And this is my question for you. So how important is it, given everything you just said, for somebody else to learn the bird's bill pattern, right? Is Are you planning on teaching that to someone? Are you, would you like to see in the future? Like what, what's your relationship to the bird's bill pattern? Yeah. Um, I think this goes into, again, like my generalized approach to teaching. Like none of the knowledge that I've inherited is mine. I have never take, taken ownership to it. I may add my own tips and tricks, but also a lot of those tips and tricks came from someone else. So I don't think I'm in a position to, cl to take claim to any of these. And so whether I'm teaching weaving or if I'm teaching dye classes, I often allude to that being like an integral part of my practice and a motif and design that I love working with. Um, so when I teach and I'm in these spaces, I often share that, hey, you should try this if you're at a level like you could or should be or could be at to accomplish uh, said design. Um, with that said, I think a bit of my gatekeeping comes out of like, I have preference for it being within my community and demographic. So it's staying within like Navajo hands. Um, with that said, it is a complicated count and interesting system, like the design itself that I, again, I don't take claim to it. I think everyone should be able to assess that. Um, but like I said, it was my own personal preference and teaching method. I think that it should go somewhere. Um, but with that said, like I said, um, when I'm teaching or within these spaces and I say someone is just passing and breezing through everything I'm throwing at them with flying colors, I'm like, cool. So here's this thing that I want you to try. Um, because hands down this piece, like, or that, um, specific outline and design is the the hardest thing I've learned in like my 14, 15 years of weaving, um, there's a little red sampler on my um, on my Instagram called uh, Bird's Eye View. It's a little red piece. And that was my first um, work that I did to break apart that, that count. I spent like, that's when I first got these um, little uh, like weaving samplers that my great grandmother had. And so I looked at that bird's bill one that she had and I it took me a week to look at it to just like sit down with it. And then I remember I sat down in October of like 2020 and it took me like an eight, 10 hour day to push up every individual weft to make that count. I had to write it on a piece of paper. I had to try it. And normally with my work, I don't like unweave my, my, my progress. But that sucker I must have unwove maybe 10, 12 times. And it was atrocious. But once it clicked, it clicked. And I, as part of that, like, I I really enjoy incorporating it into the work. Not only for, like, my own, like, retention of the, of the, of the technique, but also, again, like, to continue on and to have that in pieces, in new and living pieces that we have. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to share. I think it's important to have, and I hope that it continues to stick around because it's a really beautiful design with a really funky history. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. And looking at it, I'm not surprised that you had to unweave it a dozen times <laughs> to get it right. Oh, it hurt my head so bad. And it, every time I like sit down and incorporate it into a work and I just breeze through because my hands know what to do, like the muscle memory is there. I'm just like, oh, like I did that. <laughs> you did that. You did that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts to share with us on the relationship between textiles and text, right? Because at least in English, they share a root word, right? Yeah. And so it's, I'm sorry. I said, yeah, <laughs> agree. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, because it, so in English, they share a root word, 
And the thinking is that just like a weaver takes individual threads and weaves them together into some larger tapestry, when we're telling a story, we are also weaving together disparate parts to make a tale, right? So for me, as someone who uses text in their work, it feels very natural. Have you, how does that land with you? Um, I think I've had different approaches with it as of within different parts of my career and kind of just like workshopping my own approach to incorporating text. But I remember at first it was really just like, cool, this is a really explicit way. And as I've coined like spoon feeding an idea to a viewer and making like a direct connection with it, especially with a medium that's not really fully understood within like a larger commercialized art sphere. So in terms of having a relationship like that, that seemed like a really important like dipping of toe into this um, kind of word usage. Um, and then sometimes I'll use like, like the net words or phrases or philosophies in the work. And that's more so coming from like a cultural preservation perspective. Like I, I am learning these ideas. I'm learning a lot of these philosophies. And I think that for the sake of, it starts with keeping that connection and idea with myself and kind of learning to apply that within my life and also in the work. But also again, like some snot-nosed Diné kid in the future will probably be like, hey, I those are Navajo words. Um, I'm gonna, th that's really interesting to see. Um, but also like given that written Navajo is a fairly new thing, like it's, it's, a, it's an entirely, um, it, it didn't, that's not an original thing. Like we're, we're not a written language. So that's like a newer wave that also talks about this time and era that we're in. Um, so again, going back into that idea of documentation, that's another like factor that I've taken into consideration. But now I am at a phase where I think it kind of circling back to the original thought of like, it expedites a relationship with the viewer. It engages someone very directly and very intimately more often than not. Like specifically with the Better Don't series, it really forces a lot of people to be uncomfortable at times or to be put in a situation of vulnerability. And I had always been, I don't know where I picked up the idea. I'm sure someone coined it, some famous person coined it, but like, you know, like good art um, makes people uncomfortable or challenges someone. And I, my ego likes to think that a lot of what I incorporate into my work does that or can accomplish that. And so, um, again, like I said, texts are a really useful tool for that reason. And um, given that I am an English speaker and given that I spend almost every day of my life reading and typing and then like communicating that way and, and with that um, language, um, it feels just as part of my identity as anything else that I put into my work. Um, you know, I'm a loudmouth kid, so it would make sense that the, the language trickles into my work as well. That makes a lot of sense. Before I let you go, Tyrell, I'm really curious who you follow, who you look at when you hop on the Instagram or even larger, like it doesn't have to be social media necessarily, but who do you think are three people that you would love everybody to be paying more attention to these days? Yeah, I was so excited when you had asked me this. So I have some three heavy hitters. Kevin Aspis is one of them. He is another Dene Weaver. He's based in Shiprock, so just community over for me. Also a good friend. We just butchered two days ago, got to dish and have our little fun. And we also do combined flocks during the summer. So we get a larger herd and a lot of different other usually past apprentices of my granduncle mishmash their flocks together with ours. And so he's one of them. So not only getting to know him and his work, I just think he's a really low key guy that I think so many more people should be aware of his work. He's more of a revivalist weaver. So he's renowned for doing Navajo wedge weaving. That's his bread and butter. And honestly, probably one of the best in the game for it. Um, another name that sticks out is Navajo potter, Jared So. He's also a good friend in life, and he is based on Sanders, Arizona, southern part of the Navajo Nation, and he comes from a potter lineage, but he's just a good guy who does some really funky work, and at least for, like, both of these guys have refined the medium to such a capacity that I'm just, like, is this even, like, yeah, I'm just, like, so curious about the direction of, of the medium, their mediums, respectively, like, after 
their influence on it. I'm just like, oh my God. Kevin is one of the most nitpicky, like perfectionists I know. So his weavings are just like perfect. And then Jared So is just has everything down to a science because he just thinks about life in that perspective that I every time I see his work, I'm just like, oh God, what what can he do next? What what what's gonna happen? Well, it's like save some room for the rest of us. And then my last one is Nikosi Fields, who is this Osage, old-time fiddler, old-time musician, and kind of like a historian. He's become a good friend, and of my friend groups, I, it's pretty much just comprised of like artists, fiber nerds, historians lobbed into that, and then like old-time like musicians, or just musicians in general. And he is the sassy queen who can just fills a room and in terms of like collaborations that I see in the future I really get excited by that bookmark and relationship I have with him he has done a lot of different projects and given that like old time isn't like it's it's kind of made a resurgence in terms of just this traditional fad that I keep talking about but also just as an entity and a powerhouse of talent, this human definitely cracks the whip. <laughs> and I am ever excited to see what projects he works on, what collaborations he's featured in. And if you ever just want some good music recommendations, go blast his great tunes. The most of the time when I'm weaving, like eight times out of 10, I'm probably bumping some of his, his music. And we'll be sure to get links for those folks on the episode page. So let's make sure that happens before we hang up. All right, Tyrell. Perfect. Tyrell, thank you for getting those thoughts down and doing this little bonus episode or this bonus feature. Sorry, we didn't get in the main one, but this is actually nice. We were able to give it maybe more time this way. Agreed. I I like, I like the footnotes and cliff notes. Um, So that's good. I'm glad I made it in. (laughs) Thanks for remembering. (laughs) 